So we have two readings today. Um, one is from Psalm 118, that's verse 19 to the end. And if you want to find that in the Pew Bible, it's page <clears throat> 616. And the second reading is from Philippians 2, um, from 1 to verse 11. And if you want to find that in the page, Pew Bibles, it's page 1179. So Psalm 118, verse 19. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows and hand, join in the festal procession, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And from Philippians 2, from the beginning. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I could preach last Sunday evening sermon because Joel left his notes on the preaching stand, but hey... I'll spare you that, because you can listen to that online, so you don't need to listen to that. We'll have fresh bread this morning. Let me pray. Um, pray. Father, as we come to your word, we pray that you would speak to us today. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts and minds open to you. And Lord, our prayer is that you would speak to us this morning. Please take my words and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are at the beginning of Holy Week. It's the week leading up to and including Easter. And as we read it, the Gospels and the New Testament, we see much of the detail of what happened in that week. So today, at the beginning of the week, I just want to take a few minutes to think uh, about this day, about this week, and one or two other things, as you will hear. So at the start of the week... Here we are, Sunday, start of Holy Week. How do you think you would feel if you knew 
that this coming week was to be the defining week of your life. Somehow you knew that this week, the week beginning March the 24th, 2024, was to be the most significant in your life. That it would define your whole reason to be alive. Now I know that some of you would be very excited. You go, let's get on with it. Can't wait to see what happens. Bring it on. And then some of us uh, would be rather more nervous, frightened even, because it is the defining week. And actually, for you and me, knowing what would be our defining moment or our defining week uh, of our lives, and when it is, is actually something really hard to work out. Maybe only historians, after we are gone, can pick, our, pick through our life history and decide what was the defining moment or week of our lives. Now, it might have been the day you became a Christian, the time or season you decided to be a Christ follower. Certainly, eternally, the most significant moment in your life. Or perhaps it was when you decided to follow a particular career path or stepped into a certain ministry within your family or community or perhaps your church. Or perhaps it was your choice of wife or husband or the day you became a part, that you became a part of your family. Or maybe it was something else. It's hard to know, isn't it? Standing here this morning, I can think of a number of these moments in my own life that could be called defining moments. And whatever they are for us, the good news is that God is always about his work in our lives. He is fulfilling his purposes for us even when we take wrong turns or make poor choices. He will be at work. Put another way, we don't actually need to know what are defining moments. We simply need to remember that God is is with us and working with us today. For Jesus, it's easy for us to look at his life and see that this week was life-defining. For us, it is much harder And we can even get a little discouraged, perhaps, thinking in those terms. Please don't let that happen. Now, you may know the song Waymaker that we sing sometimes, and we're going to sing it in just a moment. So perhaps the band would like to come out. The first line says, You are here, moving in our midst. And there's a bridge in the song, later on through the song, that says, Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. So as a person of faith, we can rejoice to declare that God is at work in our lives. This may or may not be the defining week of your life or mine, but the thing we need to grasp, that even though this, was, this holy week was the defining week of Jesus' life, in our lives, God is always at work. And we need to hold on to that encouraging, encouraging truth. So let's sing this song to affirm the God who's at work in our lives. Let's stand. I worship you, I worship you. 
worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, the light in the darkness, that's who you are and you are the one at work in our lives. Even when we don't see it, you're working. We thank you Lord and help us to see that, open our eyes to see where you're at work, open our hearts and minds to acknowledge what you're doing, to give thanks, to cooperate with you. Lord, we've sung and declared, even when I don't see it, you're working. Lord, we rejoice to declare that truth. 
Thank you for being at work in our lives. Amen. Do take a seat. The last two verses of Psalm 118 said, You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. For Jesus this week was the fulfilment of the incarnation. It's the reason he was born at Bethlehem, was baptized and anointed with the Spirit. This week is the culmination of why he taught the people of Israel, why he performed amazing miracles. I wonder how Jesus was feeling on Palm Sunday. The thing is, Jesus knew that it was coming. Well before Holy Week, Jesus had taught his disciples what was to happen to him. In Matthew 16, 21, for example, he says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And the thing is, he then says, for the second time in Matthew, in Matthew 17, the next chapter, sometime later, he basically says the same thing that they will kill him, and on the third day, the Son of Man will be raised to life. The disciples were filled with grief. And in Matthew 20, Jesus says, as he was on his way to Jerusalem, he took the twelve aside and says, we're going to up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged, and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And Luke also records Jesus predicting many times that he would suffer, die, and rise again. And it's on the slide. You can see um, in Luke 5, 9, 12, 13, 17, 18, and even 24, after the resurrection, the angel says, didn't he tell you when you were, winning, when he, you were in Galilee that he would suffer, die, and rise again? And Mark's Gospel also talks about uh, the suffering of Jesus. Jesus tells the disciples about it before it happens. So what is absolutely clear is Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus knew. In our second reading, in Philippians 2, that Philippians 2 is... Uh, those verses 6 to 11, are recognised as, as a hymn, a Christian hymn. And in it, Christians declare that Jesus is in very nature God, but that he emptied himself, made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. And he humbled himself, not simply to become human, which of course is humbling when you are the creator almighty God. But he humbled himself to become obedient even to death on a cross. So in the Gospels and here in our reading in Philippians, we see clearly that Jesus knew what awaited him in that week in Jerusalem. He knew what was coming, yet he still went ahead with it. Why would you do that? Put another way, why Holy Week? Why do we have Holy Week? Why go through it? So much sadness and suffering, so much disappointment and heartbreak, even death. Why? Let's just take a moment to think about that. The second part of Philippians 2, 6 to 11, tells us that Jesus is exalted to the highest place. So after the death and resurrection, he is then exalted to the highest place, that he has the name that is above every name. He has a name at which every knee should bow, <coughs> in heaven and on earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 
That is the outcome of his earthly life and ministry, including the cross and resurrection. He is exalted, and every knee must bow to worship him. But at the start of this hymn in Philippians 2, in verse 6, we see that he was already in very nature God. As human beings, we worship God, who as the Trinity, the triune God, made all things. And if you look at Genesis chapter 1, for example, the first book of the Bible, it explains why, rather than how, creation happened. In verse 26, it reads, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. Let us. Now here, perhaps, is a glimpse of the Trinity, even though the writer of Genesis would not have had that concept at the time. The Holy Spirit at work inspiring the word of God from the beginning. And St. Augustine, in his confession, says this of Genesis chapter 1. He says, When I read that your spirit moves over the waters, I catch a faint glimpse of the Trinity which you are, my God. For it was you, the Father, who created heaven and earth in the beginning of our wisdom, which is your wisdom, born of you, equal to you, and co-eternal with you, that is, in your Son. Here then is the Trinity, my God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the creator of all creation. So our God, our triune, our Trinitarian God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator of all things, having humbled himself, is according to verse 9, exalted back to the highest place because of the events of this Holy Week. Jesus is crowned in glory. Jesus' death and resurrection win salvation for the world at the cost of him humbling himself to be one of us and die upon a cross. And today is the start of that humbling. He enters Jerusalem as the humble king on a donkey, coming in peace. Palm branches were waved. Coats and palms were strewn on the floor. Hosannas were called out. But that is all part of preparing for what is to come. So why Holy Week? It is the God of all, almighty God, humbling himself to die in our place, on a cross, so that we could be reconciled to him. It's to rescue us, to to rescue you and me from a godless eternity, so that we can be with the God of love forever. We sang a few minutes ago the hymn of heaven, which starts like this. How I long to breathe the air of heaven, where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets, to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. Jesus went through all of what is to come this week for us and because of us. Love compelled him to do it for us. How grateful should we be And today, Palm Sunday begins this journey, this defining week of Jesus' earthly life. And you can imagine that as he's being hailed with hosannas, as children and adults cry and welcome him and and delight in his coming on this colt, the foal of a donkey, into Jerusalem, as they all celebrate, and he's on this animal knowing what lies ahead. And he did all of it for you and me. 
How blessed are we that God should do this for us. How blessed are we. But the story doesn't end there for us. It's not just that this coming week is the pivotal week in Jesus' life. It is the defining moment of human history. We are called to share the good news of Jesus, to share the Easter story, to share about the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. We are shared to, to, tell, to tell the story of the humble king because he did it for the whole world. And we want the whole world to know of this God who loves them so much that he was prepared to become one of us and die for us on a cross that we could be reconciled to him. We're called to share that story. One of the people who has done that is a man called David Livingston. You may remember him. I've mentioned him before. He was the one who Stanley met in Africa, uh, uh, the only European face on the whole continent, and Stanley goes up to him, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Extraordinary. But this Livingston, who I've mentioned before, J. John, uh, men mentioned, uh, does a weekly email, and it dropped into my inbox yesterday. And this is part of what he said. When David Livingstone first began his ministry in Africa, some of the native tribes opposed him. And one tribe said they were going to kill him and everyone in his party. One afternoon, as they were setting up camp, word reached Livingstone that these warriors had been tracking him all day, were outside the camp and were going to attack and kill everyone when it got dark. That night, on the 14th of January, 1856, David Livingstone wrote in his journal, It is evening, I feel much turmoil and fear in the prospect of having all my plans knocked on the head. Those who study his handwriting said you could even see the fear in the way he wrote the letters. He went on, But Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. This is the word of a gentleman of most strict and sacred honour. So that's the end of my fear. I feel quiet and calm now. By this point in his journal, that writing is firm and no longer betrays any fear. They didn't attack that night. And later, the tribe came to faith in Jesus, wonderfully. David Livingstone asked the chief of the tribe, do you remember the night you were tracking my party? Yes, the chief replied. We heard rumours you were going to attack us, said Livingstone. That's right, the chief said. We were ready to attack the camp that night and kill you and everyone else. Why didn't you attack? David Livingston asked, and the chief said, When we got close to the camp, we looked and saw 47 warriors surrounding your camp with swords in their hands. David Livingston was baffled. They hadn't had any guards or any warriors. Later, when he was on leave in Scotland, he shared his story at a church that was supporting him. A man came up to him afterwards with his prayer journal and said, Look, I wrote it down. January the 14th, 1856, was that the night? David Livingston said it was. And the man said, That night a group of men came to pray for you. We prayed for your protection. I wrote it down. There were 47 men praying that night. Two weeks ago, Ed Shaw uh, was in Jersey. Ed Shaw is um, a church leader in Bristol. He's also co-chair of the Church of England Evangelical Council, uh, which was created by John Stott back in 1960. Anyway, Ed was here, and uh, we got talking about intercessors, about people who pray, who undergird the ministry of the church in prayer. And he said he doesn't see the next generation rising up in the same way that previous generations have done in prayer. And in his church, he sees the gaps. I'm concerned that we too may be in danger of having such a gap. 
I confess that I have perhaps not prayed as I should or could have done. Why not? I think there are many reasons, but two that I'll mention this morning, or to put it another way, two things that we need to know to raise up people who will pray, who will intercede, who will come before the throne of grace on behalf of others. The first thing is we need to grasp the power of prayer. We have failed to grasp the power of prayer. Prayer has almost become something many of us do without grasping that it is about laying hold to the weapons and resources of heaven in the cause of Christ. We have failed to see that God is ready and waiting to hear us pray and to meet us and to answer us as we do. The second that we fail to grasp is that it is vital to the world knowing God's saving love in Christ for the saints to pray. It's vital. Everyone I talk to who becomes a Christian, there has been somebody praying for them. We need to pray, grasp that prayer is vital for the salvation of the world. The 47 men back in that unknown Scottish church knew that their prayers mattered to God. And they mattered to the ministry and mission of Christ through his servant, David Livingstone. Now, usually when you pray for things like that, you hear no return on the, of the impact of your prayers. But these men heard. They discovered that prayers are the usually unseen warriors of the kingdom of God. If we wish to see lives transformed and saved because of this defining week in Jesus' life, we need to pray. I think it's no accident that Ed and I just had that conversation two weeks ago. That this message dropped into my inbox yesterday. That Joel has stirred us to pray on a Monday evening at 7.30. You're all welcome. It's no accident that a year ago at New Wine, when we were at the leaders' conference, the staff team, that what was at the top of what we came back with was we need to pray more. And it is extraordinary how a year ago God said that to us and how we just let it slip down the agenda. We need more prayer and we need more prayers. Yesterday, many of us men missed the monthly men's prayer breakfast. Eight o'clock here in church, prayer followed by breakfast in a calf. What's not to love? Next one is on April the 27th. It was this Friday yesterday, wasn't it, Terry? It's next week, is it? Wait, we haven't missed it. It's Saturday. It's all right, it was in the diary as yesterday. It's next Saturday. You you see, it shows I didn't go, doesn't it? So it's next Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, here in church. Come and pray and get breakfast. The weekly intercessors team on a Tuesday, for which I'm so grateful, is not as big as it was. If we wish to see lives transformed and our culture and society honouring Christ and his cause, we need to pray. We have a population where too few own the name of Christ and too many churches are shrinking or closing. We have an island threatened with assisted suicide, the deliberate killing of our citizens, to all our shame. We have a community with increased poverty, seeing more and more use of food banks, for example. These are all things for which we should be praying and praying about. We've declared in song, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Therefore, let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Palm Sunday and Holy Week are not simply the defining moments of Jesus' earthly life. They are the defining moments of our lives. Without this week, this Holy Week, we are all lost. But because of this week, because of this defining week in Jesus' life, we have hope, we have life, we have an eternal destiny awaiting us. Because Jesus emptied himself of all but love 
as Charles Wesley wrote in his marvellous hymn, because he left his father's throne above and humbled himself even to death on a cross, we have life and hope. And the father exalted him to the highest place. And it all begins this week on a young donkey as he rides into Jerusalem with adults and children waving palms and crying Hosanna. And for these defining moments, for this defining week, to become the defining moments for others, we need to pray. So see you here at 7.30 tomorrow if you can. Or simply pray wherever you are. It's not the end of the issue, but it is a start. Prayer is powerful. James 5.16 tells us the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And because of Jesus, you and I have been made righteous. Don't think, oh, it's little old me and I messed up this week again. Because of Jesus, you are made righteous. God loves your prayers. He values your prayers. He answers your prayers because of Jesus. We need to stop and we need to pray. But I, I wonder if some of us are being especially stirred in this area of prayer, that we, we've, we've let it slip and yet we know God has given us a special anointing for prayer. We know that there are some people who, who God just seems to have placed a special anointing or a special burden for prayer. And I want to encourage, if that's you, to do that. One of the things I'm, I'm struck with is, um, as a fellowship, we are so blessed with brothers and sisters who've, who've come here to work and to join us from Africa. And we are so grateful that you have responded to the call of God to come here. Uh, and many of you will think, well, we've come because of economic necessity and because it's where we could find the work. But I want to say it's because God has called you. And God's called you here for a purpose. David Livingstone came to Africa to be one of the many who came to share Christ. But actually, as a, a nation, we now need many of our African brothers and sisters to come back here and share Christ with us. And we covet your prayers and the prayers of your great continent for our land. So if God is stirring you to pray, don't just say, oh, that was nice, and then forget it. Put something in your diary. Change your alarm clock. Go to bed a bit early and take time to pray before you go to sleep. Whatever it is that God is nudging you to do. Or if he's wanting you to join the intercessors, speak to Ron after the service. I'm going to stop. Let me pray. Lord, you've been speaking this morning, I am sure, and confident of that. Lord, help us to rise up and respond to your call. Whatever it may be, whether it is to be a David Livingstone and go to various places and share the name of Jesus. Whether it's to be someone called to pray. But whatever it is, Lord, help us to respond to your call. Uh, and Lord, as we are entering this defining week of Jesus' life, it is also the defining week of our lives. And Lord, we worship you and thank you. Amen. Amen.